Hello friends and welcome to the second segment of this tutorial. I'm glad you made it through the first part where we worked in Blender. And now let's uh, have a look at Substance Painter. And even though this is not an introductory course to the software, uh, I will show you my workflow and how I create textures with it. Let's start off by importing the ASPIS OBJ we created in the last course. Let's set OpenGL as the normal mode and 4000 pixels for the resolution. I want the shield to be pretty high quality, uh, so that's why I choose 4000 pixels. And my philosophy is I can always downsize it later. The first thing I usually do uh, in Substance Painter is creating height information or uh, the displacement information. Uh, you can do that by simply creating a new layer and setting up a height format for it and then just painting with your alphas. First of all, uh, I select my alpha and in the layers menu I delete the original layer and add one new layer with the fill command. Then I create black mask for it. And in the settings or properties uh, window, I deselect all the uh, material channels except for the height. I set it for, uh, for example, 0 0.1 and then select my black layer mask. Uh, it's pretty similar to Photoshop, so if you work with Photoshop, you'll be right at home with this. By the way, I'm using some uh, Greek architecture patterns uh, in this workflow. Uh, I will add them to the Gumroad package that you can find uh, in the link below or uh, that you download from my Gumroad profile. Right now, I'm setting up uh, the mirroring so that I don't have to do the same work twice on both sides. And then it's just about uh, selecting the black layer mask and uh, start painting with your alpha. One thing that probably needs to be said is that uh, in the upper right corner in the texture set list, uh, you can see all the shaders we imported from Blender. And the one selected is the one I'm painting on right now. At this point, I will recommend some useful keyboard shortcuts uh, by holding down control and then uh, holding down the left mouse button and dragging up and down, you rotate your stencil. Then by holding again control and left mouse button and dragging left to right, uh, you control the opacity and uh, finally when holding control and uh, right mouse button you are scaling your stencil. You may ask why I don't do these little details in the sculpt mode in Blender. Uh, I tried it, uh, it worked, but, uh, but generally I found this workflow of creating these little details in Substance Painter much easier, much faster. So that's reason enough for me. Of course, if uh, these little details that I want to create uh, would be something bigger, something more protruding through the surface, I would probably go for uh, sculpting. But uh, these are just little engravings along the sides of this bronze so I decided it will do just to create it as a height map. Here I'm using another alpha, uh, one I uh, created uh, for the decoration of the shield's face. Uh, I want to add these two little snakes uh, on these bronze parts as well. And if you download the Gumroad version of this tutorial, uh, this alpha will be included in the project files. And there will also be a little bonus chapter about how I created it in Photoshop. 
Also worth mentioning is that I'm using orthographic view now. Uh, it prevents uh, from uh, distorting the painting of the alpha, but you can see that I just changed it to the normal perspective view by using the little cube icon in the upper part of the window. And now again, let's go back to the uh, shelf uh, where my alphas are stored. Uh, choose the right one and start detailing another part of the model. Here, of course, I forgot to activate my mirroring, so uh, I'm correcting the error. But obviously I chose the wrong axis. Uh, I have to choose Z axis and you can always preview the mirroring plane. And after choosing Z axis, everything should be quite okay. I'm actually using two brushes uh, with this pattern. Uh, one that is horizontally flipped. Uh, I actually flipped it in Photoshop and imported a new one. Uh, I wasn't able to find out how to flip a brush or the alpha uh, directly in Substance Painter. So if anybody knows, just let me know in the comments or uh, on my email. And now again, I'm adding the snakes and thus finishing the engravings on the armband. Right now I'm scrolling through the other alphas that are included uh, in Substance Painter and I'm using them to create scratches. By hitting X, you invert uh, the color of your alpha or your mask so that with a white color you paint uh, your height information and with black color you delete it. Of course when uh, painting with gray color just as in Photoshop when you're painting your masks it basically works like opacity of the brush. While I was talking I duplicated the height layer and created a new one where I set the height uh, instead of for negative 0.1 to 0.1. And thus now the details I paint do not stick out out of the surface, but they go inside uh, just as a normal scratch would do. The whole of the process is now pretty straightforward. Uh, you just paint your details with white color and then uh, smooth them out or delete them with black color. And just like when painting in Photoshop, uh, it's more about your artistic choice than anything else. These scratches on the inside of the shield are uh, pretty normal. When the hoplites fought, they often revealed the inside of their shields. For example, when thrusting their spears or uh, stabbing with their swords, uh, the inside part of their shield often was revealed to the enemy and they tried to attack their hands and fingers uh, for them to not be able to hold their shield. So these types of uh, scratches and deep cuts on the shield were not something unusual. All in all, the aspis is probably the most important part and most iconic part of the hoplite gear because uh, while there were hoplites who just fought in their clothes and they didn't even have any helmet, uh, they always wore a shield, otherwise they wouldn't be hoplites, they couldn't fight in the shield wall. And that's one of the reasons why I chose this uh, shield to be the first model I create for this series of tutorials. Here I'm still experimenting with different alphas. Uh, I try to find some that make the most sense for uh, a damage of a bronze part of the gear. 
in my opinion, uh, the default set of alphas that Substance Painter provides is quite enough for uh, anything you need to paint. But of course, if you make your own uh, alphas for scratches and stains and stuff like that, it is of course always better. At this point, I quickly go in with a regular soft brush and I try to make uh, different uh, pieces of the engraving uh, a little bit more uneven. I'm also adding a little scratches here and there. Again, as I said, white color adds the scratches uh, or adds the alpha mask. Uh, black color removes it. And in this way, I continue on all of the inner part of the shield. Uh, I add little indents, little scratches, little holes and carefully chip away on the original decoration where needed. In this second part of the Substance Painter tutorial, uh, we'll be adding details to the face of the shield. And since the workflow is the same as in the previous chapter, I just add a height layer where I start masking various holes and scratches. Uh, I will speed up the whole footage and just comment when I do something different than in the previous chapter. In the previous fun fact, I mentioned that the shield was pretty heavy, several kilos heavier than a medieval shield. And unlike rectangular shields of Romans, it did not offer protection for the groin, legs and sometimes not even the shoulders. Thus it may seem it was actually pretty worthless, unless you realize its real purpose. The aspis was made for a fight in a very close-knit formation called phalanx, and above that for pushing the front rows of soldiers forward. The circular bowl shape was ideal for this pushing. Really, what happened between two phalanxes that met was initially a spear carnage between the first two rows of hoplites, while the rest of the rows just waited their turn. When the spears were broken, it was time for close combat and, more importantly, the pushing. The front row of soldiers was pressed forward by their comrades in the back rows into the enemy formation in order to disrupt it in any way they could, if not by the skill of their arms, then at least by the weight of their bodies. And this was fun fact number three. If you remember from the reference chapter, uh, I mentioned that I want to add uh, little wrinkles on the side of the shield. I achieved these wrinkles by this sort of brush. And in the brush properties panel, you can set it to follow path. And just as it is in Photoshop, this will uh, take in account uh, the direction of your stroke and rotate the brush uh, based on it. And after these wrinkles are done, I, I continue to detail the rest of the shield, uh, going back and forth, adding little details here and there using the same method. It's time for another fun fact. You already know that the shield was cumbersome and often used primarily for pushing the soldiers in front of the hoplite, be it enemies or friendlies. To teach young men to handle this tool better, the Greek developed an Olympic discipline called hoplitodromos. Here they competed in running in their armor and helmet, holding the shield in the left hand. The length of the track was about 700 meters or 2,200 feet. It's generally thought that this discipline were to prepare hoplites for the fight with Persians. Eastern empires often used bowmen and so it was vital to close the distance between the two armies as fast as possible before the archers had a chance to reload. And that was the fun fact number four.
Lastly, I switch to the leather material. Uh, again, create a fill layer with height active and add the black mask and then start painting scratches on the letter. Fun fact time! Since in the phalanx the shield was used to protect its wearer just as much as the man on the left of him, there was a general tendency of the whole phalanx to drift to the right. The soldiers simply tried to huddle as close as possible to the man on the right to be protected by their espies. The result of this was that the whole army moved to the right when marching and often was not able to hit the enemy line that was originally right in front of them. Of course, the enemy line frequently drifted to the right as well, so the result was a total chaos. And this was fun fact number 5. Once these little details are ready, uh, I will prepare the model for baking of the various maps we will use. Before the actual baking process took place, I realized one thing that I wanted to change on the geometry. I decided to export all of the rings holding the rope into Substance Painter instead of just one ring. Uh, there are two reasons for that. First, I want to bake a proper ambient occlusion map that will give me occlusion for each ring of the geometry. Also, I wanted to make each ring different in its texture. In the end, it meant making each ring unique in Blender, making new UVs for it. So now you see me exporting a new version of the geometry now with all the rings and the handle. And uh, you can update your model in Substance Painter uh, by going to Edit, Project Configuration and then selecting your new geometry. Hopefully uh, Substance Painter just takes this new mesh and applies all your changes on this updated model. Fortunately, this is what happened here, and so I could easily continue working on it. I decided to speed up the footage of this chapter again, because I'm using the same techniques as I used in the first two chapters. Fun fact number six. There were actually different types of shields used among hoplites. The Aspis, or Hoplon, how it was originally called, was the common one. There was also a lighter Boeotian shield, with two circular protrusions along its sides, used to inserting a spear. You could see that one in the movie Troy, where it was held by Brad Pitt as Achilles. Also there was an Attic moon-shaped shield, however it was generally used by skirmishers and javelin men, not really the heavy hoplites. Gradually, the Aspis became lighter and lighter, so that the hoplites were able to fight longer and march with it along greater distances. The Macedonians under Alexander the Great mastered this. They carried a lighter Telamon shield that was characteristic by its strap. The Macedonian pikeman could hang the shield around his neck by the strap and prop it on his arm, while holding a new type of double-handed weapon, a long pike called Sarissa. And with this fact, it's time to end this lesson. Before I exported the height information, uh, I decided to add a little filter to my uh, alphas. Uh, you do that by selecting your alpha and adding filter, in this case blur. And I chose a very little number to smooth the result just a tiny little bit, but it definitely helps to remove the crisp edges. And now that we're done with that, we are ready to export the first batch of the textures. For that I create uh, my substance pre folder. Uh, basically what we're doing now is exporting the newly created height information we will plug it in inside the Substance Painter and only after that we will bake all the maps that the object needs.
This way, the baking process will take into account the height information we just created. For this first export, I'm using just the normal PBR metal rough uh, config. Later, I will use my own that I created for Blender. But really, at this point, we just care about the height and normal information. After the export is done, I drag and drop the normal textures that this process exported. I import them into project as a texture file and then plug in the normal map to each individual material. When you hover over the thumbnail, you can see the name. So be sure to plug in the proper normal map. And immediately you can see that the normal map uh, takes effect and you can now disable your height information that we created in the previous section. Okay, and now finally we are ready for the baking stage. For that I go to texture set settings window and I hit bake mesh maps. Uh, as you can see I'm using uh, the 4000 pixels wide setting. Uh, also I'm baking everything except the normal and the ID maps. If you encounter some problems with baking the ambient occlusion map I uh, encourage you to try uh, unchecking or checking ignore back faces and also playing with the number of max occlusion distance. I don't bake the normal map because we already have our normal map plugged in. And then when everything is ready I just hit bake maps and, and wait until the process is finished. After the baking is done, you should see something like this uh, when all the ambient occlusion is smooth and all the detail that we created with the alpha painting is baked in. Here you see me trying to preview the texture in Substance Painter and failing. So I rather decide to export it on the hard drive and open it in Image Editor. And yes, you can see that the detail is baked in, thus the process was successful. In this section we will move to a completely new phase of the shading process and that is the actual shading of the shield. Uh, for this, I go to Substance Source. Uh, if you are a subscriber of Substance Painter, you can just download any materials from there directly from Substance Painter. And I downloaded the antique bronze material. This material I use as a base for the bronze shader I'm going to create. And I apply it to the bronze outer material and start adjusting it to my liking. The majority of this chapter we will spend in the layers window and the properties window at the very right of the screen. Already you can see me adjusting the UV scale of the bronze texture. It basically controls the scale of the repeating pattern. One keyboard shortcut I use all the time is holding down shift and right mouse button and dragging it. It will change the rotation of the HDR map um, mapped into the environment of the software and uh, change the direction of light. Okay, let's start fiddling around with the settings of the shader. Uh, first of all, let's set roughness to 0.3 or 0.25. Also let's change the color of the bronze a tiny bit, uh, more to the orange tone or the reddish tone. Make it a little darker and a little more saturated. I also learned that adding some finish rough filter adds to the realism of the shader. 
though I think the default settings are a little too intense so I dial down the intensity and as you can see this uh, filter helps to break up the roughness and the reflections a little I play around with the settings a tiny bit more just trying things out uh, but when I'm happy I move uh, to another layer I create a new fill layer and for the base color I sample the color of the bronze and make it darker because we will make a dirt layer from this fill layer I also only use the channels I need for this layer uh, so for rough I need just color, roughness and metallic channels now I'm playing around with the color of the dirt a bit more. I'm adding new black mask and I start creating automatically generated mask uh, based on the maps that we baked uh, during the baking process. For that we use this mask editor and specify some values here. When sliding down through this mask editor window, you find pull down menus for textures. In this, I type dirt one and I plug in the texture that uh, substance provides. From my previous attempts, I know I want the value of 0 0.5 in the contrast and 0 0.35 for the balance. Of course, any of these values you are welcome to play around with and adjust them to your liking. Now I specify the opacity of the texture visibility and then slide down again and specify the second texture for this mask editor. In this case it will be Grunge Rust. and I set its opacity to 0 0.7. After that, I play around with the contrast and balance of this mask editor, which basically controls the overall behavior of the maps plugged in to this filter. With that, I'm happy with this dirt layer and it's time to move on to another layer uh, which will be surface imperfections. So first of all just add another fill layer. Disable the color, metal and normal maps. Then set the height for a little number like 0 0.2 and the roughness to something like 0 0.6. For this layer we will again be using mask editor and we plug in a texture called Grunge Map 12. Its opacity we will set to 1 and uh, while we are at it set the texture 2 opacity to 0 0.4 and in the texture 2 slot plug in Gaussian Spots 2. Let's set the contrast to 0 0.25 which creates these scratches on the edges of the shield but uh, I try to compensate this by playing with the overall balance and the contrast of the mask editor. At this point I'm definitely experimenting with the result uh, but you can either copy my results or try to play with yours and see what you like. Fact about the bronze, the layer of bronze was actually very thin, usually not even one millimeter thick. The purpose here was not added protection, the effect was rather decorative and psychological. The hoplites often polished this sheet of bronze so much so that it reflected the environment around it. And that was the quick fact number seven.
In the end, I decide that the edge effect is a bit too much. So I add a paint layer and try to manually soften this effect. And just as we did with painting the little details, uh, by defining a black color with your alpha, just like in Photoshop, you remove the effect and by adding white color, you bring it back. Now when I go to the bottom view, I can see that the environment map doesn't really illuminate the bottom part. So I go to the display settings and then I play around with the environment exposure. Uh, and also I'm changing the environment map to some other and see if it helps the visibility. All right, time for another layer. This time we will add some uh, slight edge details and highlights. Uh, so for this purpose, again, sample the color of the shield. Uh, this time make it a little lighter. Uh, disable the normal map and set the height for 0 0.2, the roughness for 0 0.2 as well, and metallicness for one. Then, as usual, add Mask Editor. In the Texture slot, uh, add Grunge Map and this time 0, 9. Set its balance to 0 0.6 and the Texture Opacity to 1. Set the overall balance to about 0 0.6 and the contrast to 0 0.5. And then also play around a little with the curvature opacity, uh, setting it to a lower number. And you can see the little details on the corners starting to appear, but I don't really want it to be set to a normal settings. I want to add these details to the original texture and the surface imperfections we did earlier. So I set it to linear dodge. This way we not only add details, but also some nice highlights on the edges of the shield, breaking up the uniformity of the bronze. I will repeat myself, but you should never forget two things saving your projects and naming. Now I'm still not really happy with the dirt, uh, namely I want more dirt in the crevices of the geometry. So I'm duplicating the dirt layer and creating new smart mask for it. And I'm using this uh, occlusion smart mask. You will find it in the shelf in the smart masks folder. I'm making the color a little bit more saturated and a little darker and then playing around with the metallic and the roughness settings. This way I added a nice little uh, layer of detail in the ridges and places where surfaces meet. And with that, the base of the bronze is ready. And in the next part, we will start with coloring. We will start coloring the bronze by duplicating the bronze base color we already created. I will name it blue bronze and start changing its color. Let's raise the saturation and make it a little darker. And also I want this part of the bronze to be a little more rough as a result of the bronze smith tampering with the metal. Also I play around with uh, 
some of the other uh, options for this material until I'm happy with the result. Of course, I want the blue metal to be visible only on the face of the shield. And uh, of course, I could manually mask it out, but there's an easier solution. You just go and select this UV chunk fill and with one click you fill a region of the UVs with the desired material. It basically creates a mask uh, along the seams of the UVs we created. After that I simply go in and manually paint out uh, the areas uh, that are damaged and I want the normal bronze to be visible through the blue bronze there. Fun fact time! When it comes to the shield face decoration, it was often the only way one hoplite could recognize the other. There were no distinct uniforms in the classical Greece times, so unless a soldier recognized the symbol on the shield, the look of the helmet or the bronze armor on the man in front of him, he could very well consider him an enemy. Needless to say, in the chaos of the battlefield, there were countless cases of deaths by the hand of the friendly soldiers, sometimes even friends or relatives. What a bad way to go. And that was fun fact number 8. Okay, so now I am happy with this blue bronze variation and it's time to create a black bronze for the symbol of the snakes we will use. For that again I will reuse the blue bronze variation uh, and I just rename it properly and then give it a black color. Right now I'm rearranging the order of the layers and I'm putting the black bronze at the very top uh, above the dirt and surface imperfections. I'm testing how it's going to look. Also playing with the settings of uh, the actual bronze shader. And now it's finally time to use the snake symbol. Uh, I created this symbol in a bonus chapter uh, for this course and you will find it on Gumroad in the bonus video section. To properly use and scale the stencil I use a size space set to texture and the alignment set to camera. And when I paint the symbol, I immediately see that my shader is not set properly. Fortunately, it's an easy fix. You just disable the height channel on the material. Here I'm again reordering the uh, layers and trying to get the details that we created uh, in the previous chapter. Uh, to appear on the snakes. And of course it's never too late to play around with the dirt and the roughness and other settings of the shader. All right, now the shader looks good and it's time to create a folder for it and put all the layers inside this folder. And the beautiful thing about Substance Painter is that in this way you basically create smart materials. You can just copy this folder and paste it to other shaders and on all those other objects it will create the same effect as we created for this 
outer bronze material. Later in the process I actually created a red bronze variation and I started painting the snakes with little details. Uh, however, I wasn't too happy with the result, so I decided against it. Uh, still, I will include it here uh, for in case you want to create your own little details. You can just watch my workflow and work along. We have some time, so let's squeeze in a short fun fact. For all its size and mass, the shield was never expected to protect against all kinds of attacks. Often even an arrow could pierce through it. On the Greek vases, uh, we can find many depictions of spears stuck halfway through the enemy aspis. Generally, the phalanx soldiers rather tried to divert the enemy blow by angling the shield slightly so that the weapon would slide across it. Many ancient soldiers and even generals died when their shield simply cracked or gave way. For example, a famous Spartan commander Brasidas fell at 422 BC at Amphipolis when a spear went right through his aspis into his uncovered neck. And that was fun fact number 9. At this point, however, I added a detail that I wanted to create all along. And it is this circular Greek pattern uh, that goes along the rim of the shield. I just positioned it as best as possible and stenciled it on the black bronze layer. Here you can see me experimenting with turning on and off various layers and ultimately I decided that the red layer doesn't really look that good and that I will simply delete it. And with that done it was time to move on to the other materials. In this part we will quickly shade the armband uh, by simply using the bronze material we already created. Uh, here you can see me copying uh, the bronze material I used for the shield. You do that by simply hitting Ctrl C. Then you go to the other material up in the texture set list window and you Ctrl paste this copied folder. It will compute for a while and just like that we have the material set up. Now all I have to do is delete the layers I don't need. For example this blue bronze layer. And after observing the object for a little while and rotating the light I realize it works quite fine except for some uh, hand-painted layers that don't work on this object and uh, I decided to adjust some mask editor options for this surface imperfections layer. Uh, it's all about just going in, playing around with the values you already added, seeing what works for this new object. All right, that looks good. I still can't get over the fact how easy the Substance Painter is and I must say that this was the best buy of the whole year for me. Uh, I love this program and I love texturing. It was never the strongest discipline for me but I immensely enjoy it these days. After some consideration I decided to bring back the blue bronze layer and try to make the decoration blue. Uh, in the end I deleted this bronze layer again but for now you can see the workflow and the UV chunk fill selection again. Uh, this method saves a lot of time so definitely remember it for your projects. And this is how fast it is to copy and paste uh, the smart materials in Substance Painter. What used to take hours in Photoshop uh, is now a matter of a few clicks.
The last layer that remains to be textured is the leather layer. For this one I choose the leather rough variation, um, but I change the color to blue. And again start fiddling with the saturation and the lightness of the texture. The resolution of the texture seems a little low to me, so I raise the number in the UV scale. I also raise the intensity of the small stains on the surface and make the roughness a little less intense. Something around 0 0.8 is quite enough. Here I'm adding a new layer, uh, it will be dirt and I'm turning off the height and normal information and making it dark. And after that I add a black mask and a generator to again create uh, the alpha for this layer. I add grunge dirt to the texture 1 and scratches to texture 2 and then play around with the intensity of both of these. And I also want to create a lighter layer of the leather uh, and use it for highlighting the edges of the geometry. I create it by duplicating the leather base, making it lighter and adding a smart mask called Metal Edge Wear. I know it's Metal Edge, but it works in this case just fine. I'm also playing a bit with the roughness of the base layer, but after a while I'm happy with the result. And with that the shield textures are almost ready. We will just go through a few finishing touches in the next chapter. In the area where the surface of the leather is scratched, it makes sense that uh, the wooden structure would be revealed. For that I'm adding a new layer of wooden material, in this case it's walnut. I know I said in the reference chapter that these shields were made of uh, wood like a poplar tree or willow tree, but walnut will do just fine in this case. Of course I'm changing the color of this wood and then I'm adding black mask and starting to paint on it. There of course is a possibility to create a smart mask for masking out these scratches but generally I found out that easier and quicker solution is just to paint it out yourself manually. This is the case only when you have uh, one or two scratches like me. If you have a huge model full of scratches, uh, your best option is to create that filter. Again now when I'm painting, I'm using different colors, uh, black to removing the wooden parts and white for adding wooden parts and then uh, shades of gray to add semi-transparent places. At this point I'm playing with the height profile and the values of the height channel uh, just to make the scratches look more 3D uh, and for the edges to catch more light. And then I move on to the other scratch.
with that done I think our textures for the whole shield are ready and we are prepared to bring them back to Blender. Now that our shaders are ready, it is time to export them. Uh, you just simply go to File, Export and you choose a profile that fits your needs. In my case, I created my own profile for Blender export. If you don't know how to do it, uh, just go to YouTube, uh, type in Substance Painter export to Blender and you will find several very good tutorials that will teach you how to do it. In my case, I use base color, metalness, roughness, normal and height map. In Blender, I will be using normal map instead of the height map, but just in case I export both of them. Finally, I specify the folder I want the textures to be exported to and let Substance Painter do its job. We conclude this chapter and move on to the final part of this course, which will be lighting, shading and texturing inside Blender. Thanks for listening and see you in the next part.